for anyone who's had Lyme disease, and particularly if you ever had a Lyme skin rash, there are different manifestations of Lyme rashes. So when I saw it on myself, I'm like, oh my gosh, is this a Lyme rash again? And then within a couple of days of that first patch showing up, you know, I saw that whole Christmas tree distribution. So I'm like, okay, it's fine. It's just psoriasis. <laughs> Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to episode number 126 of the Healthy Skin Show. In today's episode, I'm going to be talking about a very specific type of skin rash condition. It's called pityriasis rosea. And oftentimes when people get this, they completely freak out because it looks a lot worse than it really is. I'm going to talk with my guest about what the identifying features are because they're pretty specific and what you need to know about it and how to actually care for it. Before we dive into my interview today, I want to take a listener's question. You guys know I love answering your questions. And this particular question, which is a good one, comes from one of our listeners named Donna. Jennifer, I'm a 68-year-old grandmother who has suffered from mysterious skin conditions since I hit puberty. These began as styes and moved into bacterial infections filled with pus that eventually drained and scarred. Stress seems to be a real factor in the number and length of these infections. Early on, conventional Western medicine always treated them with antibiotics. As I got older, I began to treat them myself, avoiding antibiotics, using hot compresses, soaking Epsom salt baths, and a golden seal to bring them to a head to get them to drain. Then I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's in 2015. I'm currently on a biocidin detox protocol for candida and suspected biofilms. My autoimmune Hashimoto's and lichen sclerosis are in remission, but my skin has reared its ugly head once again. Even though I started low and slow on the biocidin, it's like the detox process is making my skin much worse than before. Is this normal? Donna, I can completely understand your concern. It is pretty typical to experience a flare-up of rashes if certain conditions are not tended to before you start doing a protocol that includes something like an antimicrobial, like biocidin, for example, which is what you're taking. And that specific area that I'm referencing is your phase two liver detox pathways. If they are not properly supported before you dive into this whole sort of like, we call it almost like a kill phase at times in the more integrative world. If you don't make sure to support those pathways, it becomes very challenging for your body to deal with all of the toxins that are produced as a result of that whole antimicrobial activity that you have going on in your system. So to me, it sounds like you're doing a ton of work and you already have done a ton of work, but it is entirely possible that in the process of doing that, your phase two detox pathways became depleted. Now, what I mean by that is that these pathways require very specific nutrients. Many of these nutrients are not things that our body makes. We have to have a constant influx or supply. And you have to consider that if you've been dealing with a lot of things, right? So a lot more stuff than normal is headed your liver's way. It's highly likely that these reserves have become depleted, making it increasingly difficult for your liver to do what it needs to do. I've talked about this on the show many times, and I have a very specific episode where we discuss this, I'll link to that in the show notes. Now, here's the thing. You really have to fill these wells back up. I'm not sure, based on your case, whether it would be the right thing to pause what you're doing, work on your liver first, and then reintroduce everything, or to just add it in now. That's something you need to discuss with your practitioner and make the decision that is best for you. I will link to the product that I use in my private practice over in the show notes if that's something that you want to check out or discuss with your practitioner. Now, a few basic things that you can keep in mind. Milk thistle and even liposomal glutathione can be great ways of refilling your glutathione reserves. Milk thistle is not 
super duper effective, but it will help provide you with a bit more glutathione from some clinical research that I've read. Nettle tea can also be helpful in supporting the liver. Broccoli sprouts provide your liver with sulforaphanes. And if we need to get more sulfur into the system because we do need it, MSM and worse comes to worse, NAC can also be beneficial. The only hang up I have with NAC is that I've read in certain areas that it can be considered almost like a chelator. So for those of you who have mercury amalgams or fillings, you might want to think twice about NAC. But again, that is for you to decide what's best for you with your own practitioner. Sweating is also an excellent option, okay? Sweating can be incredibly beneficial because remember, our skin is also a detox pathway. That's why you have to look at the liver. You have to look at urination. You have to look at bowel movements. And we need to look at the skin's ability to detoxify things or move them out through the pores. Sweating can be done in either a dry sauna or a steam sauna. It just depends on what you have access to, frankly. There's plenty of other options, but some people don't have them available locally to them. Like I don't have any infrared saunas available to me in my local area. So the best thing I'm going to get is a shower, essentially, that's hot. But you can take liposomal glutathione before you step into that sauna or you plan on sweating, and that can also help reduce any flare-ups. Now, one really great tip that my colleague Laura Adler shared is that when you do really sweat, you want to rinse off your skin afterwards. That way, we are rinsing away any of the toxins that have been pushed out of those pores so that they are not sitting on the skin and creating further irritation and then dry yourself off. The other piece to this is that you may want to consider the use of a binder. And again, this would be something to discuss with your practitioner. It is not uncommon with biocidin to use a binder, especially if you're experiencing these types of reactions. They help to essentially mop up all of the toxins and bacterial and fungal parts that are just hanging out in your GI tract as a result of the biocidin. That way we can expedite them out of the system a little bit faster and they can't create more problems. Now, there are do's and don'ts around those. I'm not going to get into that. Speak with your practitioner about what the best way to use a binder if they feel it's right for you. And last but not least, make sure to drink plenty of fluids. You have to remember that in the process of addressing gut issues, you start to see things come out of your skin. Remember, we need fluids. We need water in our GI tract. Your skin also needs fluids. And we think about moisturizing from the outside, but you have to remember that moisture also comes from the inside out. And so make sure that you are drinking plenty of fluids. If you can't remember, set a timer. Make it a habit that you cannot do X before you drink your two glasses of water in the morning. Do whatever you have to do to drink those fluids. I hope, Donna, that this is helpful and gives you some food for thought here. And for anybody who's also going through this, I hope too that this is insightful because it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to suffer through some sort of quote unquote detox reaction of your skin simply because you're doing something else. Usually to me, that is a sign that there's something else that needs to be addressed under the surface before you can really deal with that. So keep that in mind. Those are my ideas, my two cents. And um, you know, if you have a burning question on anything, it could be supplements, it could be how the skin is connected to this or hand washing or anything at this point, feel free to head on over to healthyskinshow.com. Leave us a voicemail there and you could be featured on an upcoming episode of the show. All right. With all that said, let's dive into today's interview with Dr. Darren Ingalls. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Today, I have a recurring guest with me. One of my favorite guests, one of my favorite people, actually. His name is Dr. Darren Ingalls, and he is a respected leader in natural medicine with more than 28 years experience in the healthcare field. He's board certified in integrated pediatrics and a fellow of the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. Dr. Ingalls has published extensively and is the author of The Lyme Solution, a five-part plan to fight the inflammatory autoimmune response and beat Lyme disease. And this is a comprehensive natural approach to treating Lyme disease. You guys might remember we talked about Lyme last year. 
Um, and also, he specializes not just in Lyme, but in autism and chronic immune dysfunction using diet, nutrients, herbs, homeopathy, and immunotherapy to help his patients achieve better health. Dr. Ingalls, thank you so much for joining us again. Oh, thanks for having me back on, Jen. This is exciting. We're going to talk about a topic that has never been covered on the Healthy Skin Show yet. It's the first time ever. And frankly, I had never heard of this condition when you shared this with me. And when I went to look at pictures, I'd be like, oh my gosh, if that happened to me, I would freak out. So I think it's a <laughs> really good topic to talk about because when we deal with rashes, it can be really frustrating. And sometimes you don't know whether you need to go to the doctor or whether it's something really serious. And even you shared too that you've actually had this issue and you thought it was something coming back. Yeah, so pityriasis rosea is a, uh, fortunately it's a benign condition. And I think what really freaks people out is the initial presentation of the skin rash is you get a thing called a herald patch. And what it is, it's a large lesion. Typically it occurs somewhere on your trunk. So it could be on your back, could be on your belly, could be on your sides. And it's, it's, it can be about anywhere from three to about six centimeters, uh, but it's usually it's oval shaped. It's a flat rash. It doesn't tend to be terribly itchy. It's mildly itchy, but it kind of appears out of nowhere. And then shortly thereafter, it follows by several other smaller lesions that typically run along your back, your upper arms, your upper legs. And the one thing about this skin rash that's very unique is we call it a Christmas tree distribution. So if you stand back from someone who has it and you just look at their back, basically, you know, you can imagine these lesions kind of start at the spine and almost like the branch is coming off a, a pine tree or a Christmas tree, mm -hmm. they start to, you know, swerve out from the spine out to your sides and, uh, you know, it'll go from, you know, your neck all the way down to your waist. So, and that herald patch, that one large lesion will be much larger than all the other lesions. So if the herald patch, you know, runs, you know, three to six centimeters plus, you know, these other lesions may only be one to two centimeters or smaller. Uh, again, it's a non-raised, mildly itchy rash. Mm -hmm. And the good news about it, again, is it is a benign skin rash. So for people who develop it and see it and go, oh, my gosh, uh, there really isn't a whole lot of conventional treatment for it because it's not problematic. Uh, you could use steroids uh, if you or some sort of moisturizer just if the one lesion does get a little irritated. But it's a self-limiting skin condition, and typically within six to eight weeks, it resolves on its own. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't really know what causes pityriasis. I'd say in my uh, population where I've seen it, typically I see it in people who've undergone some sort of stress. So I imagine it's a function of when your immune system's compromised, you know, this skin rash is allowed to sort of surface. Again, it happened to me, and you know, for anyone who's had Lyme disease, and particularly if you ever had a Lyme skin rash, that that classic erythema migrans bullseye rash, uh, there are different manifestations of Lyme rashes. So when I saw it on myself, I actually had it on my left side. Uh, I'm like, oh my gosh, is this a Lyme rash again? And then within a couple of days of that first patch showing up, you know, I saw that that whole Christmas tree distribution. So I'm like, okay, it's fine. It's just psoriasis. <laughs> you know, panic button went down and everything's cool again. But again, the, the good news is it is self-limiting. And usually within about two months, it'll go away on its own. And so with this, it sounds like there could also be confusion with ringworm and some other rashes that people have because when i looked at the pictures i was like "Ooh, i would pro i would freak out i'm being honest with you yeah like i would definitely freak out and think like i got into something or i was exposed to something so is it that it's confused sometimes at the dermatologist office or is it more just confusion in general when you're trying to self-diagnose what it is yeah, a dermatologist really won't have much problem diagnosing it. Okay. Again, it's got a very, the pattern of it looks very different than ringworm. Ringworm compared to pityriasis tends to get very scaly around the edges of the lesion. And ringworm is much more itchy. I mean, ringworm, you want to peel your skin off sometimes. With pityriasis, it's generally, it's mildly itchy, uh, not nearly to the intensity you see with ringworm. Ringworm also tends, the lesions tend to be much more circular in their pattern where the lesions of pityriasis are a bit more oblong, they're smaller, but again, the distribution's really the, the key difference between the two. Um, and again, if you were con confused, particularly with that Herald patch, you know, if you tried using an antifungal on it, it really wouldn't do anything. Mm. Where with ringworm, typically a topical antifungal will help pretty quickly. Oh, that's so. a good, that's an interesting little test. 
Yeah. Yeah. If you were really unclear, I mean, you could go buy an over the counter, you know, tenactin or one of those topical antifungals, you know, and if it starts to get better, you have a pretty good idea. It's fungal. And if it doesn't change at all, then there's a pretty good chance it's not fungal. But again, if you started getting that wider distribution throughout your back, your, your front and your shoulders, Again, if you went to a dermatologist, they really wouldn't have much difficulty making that diagnosis. Okay. And is this something that is potentially contagious if, like, you've got little ones in the house or a spouse or any? Is it contagious? No, no, it's not contagious at all. Okay. So again, it's one of those things that looks worse than it is. But yeah, there's no, no there's nothing to spread. It's not, uh, it's not caused by a bacteria virus, at least as far as we know. But uh, yeah, it's not a contagious lesion. That's so interesting that it pops up. Any ideas or thoughts that you have about why maybe the Christmas tree pattern in the back? Well, you know, the only thing that follows a Christmas tree pattern back is our nerves. Uh, our nervous system kind of has that distribution for where the nerve root comes out of your spine as it goes around your body. It does kind of follow that distribution. So, you know, when we see shingles outbreaks, you know, it will follow a nerve line, although it doesn't break out to the same degree that, that pityriasis does. It may just be one little spot that you get a shingles outbreak and you would never confuse shingles for pityriasis. Um, you know, shingles are you know blisters, they're vesicles, they're fluid filled, uh, completely different. And shingles typically is very painful. So yes. um, I can actually I can actually agree with you. I had shingles when I was 27. Ah. <laughs> oh, so yeah. for shingles is brutal. It is. Fortunately, my dad, because he's an ophthalmologist, we would see it so frequently in his office of people that would get shingles on their face and the primary care doctors didn't know what it was. And unfortunately, it got worse. And so I, I really got good at being like, Dad. I think there's the shingles case in room two. And sure enough, it was always shingles. So when it started to come on, I knew the symptoms quite well. And I, I said to my parents, I said, I think I have shingles. And my mom's like, you're too young. Sure enough, I had shingles. So yeah, I don't think shingles necessarily has a uh, an age group that uh, no. it discriminates against. And again, if your immune system's <laughs> compromised yeah. for any reason, uh, you know, you potentially can get shingles, particularly if you've had chicken pox when you were little. So it's the same virus. Yeah. And um, yeah. So, you know, with pityriasis, like I said, fortunately, it's not contagious. It goes away on its own, even if you did absolutely nothing. But I think, you know, when it first comes on again, it, like you said, it really freaks people out because they see this, you know, lesions de developing all over their torso. Not really understanding why. But yeah. again, my best guess is that they're probably something related to our nerve roots just because that distribution you know, it's so characteristic that uh, we don't see really another skin lesion that does that. Hmm. And is there anything in your experience when you've had patients come in with it that they could do just in general to help care for it? I mean, I know you mentioned steroid creams, but if somebody doesn't want to go the steroid cream route because obviously they're uncomfortable with that, what are there any is there anything else you could suggest, even if it's not topical? Like, do you even think yeah. like stress reduction could be helpful? Well, I think, you know, stress reduction, immune support definitely helps in my practice. So, you know, a lot of nutrients that help support the immune system. So we have people up their vitamin C. You can use, you know, vitamin D, vitamin A, zinc. You know, those four nutrients are kind of my go-to to help support the the immune system. And, you know, topically, just for some comfort, if you've got, you know, one or two lesions that really seem to be bother you, we've got a lot of great herbal topicals that are quite helpful you can use comfrey, calendula, you can use uh, chickweed. All of those are really good for helping taking the itch out, moisturizing the skin. And there's a lot of companies that make combinations of those three herbs. So chickweed is actually one of the best for the itch. Can you actually talk a little bit about that for a moment? Because I don't sure. think anybody's ever mentioned chickweed in all of the episodes I've done. <laughs> so what, yeah. is, what is chickweed? So it's chickweed, its botanical name is called Stellaria. Uh, and Stellaria is a, it's an herb and uh, chickweed uh, is one of the herbs that has one of the best sort of anti itch effects. Mm. So you'll find that a lot of botanical companies, if they make a topical for eczema or any other, you know, itchy lesion, they'll typically include chickweed where calendula and comfrey are probably a little bit better just in terms of smoothing out or soothing the irritated skin. Uh, the chickweed very specifically is really effective for reducing the itch. And what ends up happening with all these itchy skin lesions, of course, is the new skin starts to lay down 
people start scratching it, particularly if you got long nails, you break that new skin and you yeah. kind of recycle that process over and over and over. So a lot of getting skin to heal, no matter what the lesion is, if we can just stop you from itching it and letting that new skin lay down, it, it heals a lot faster. Yeah. So I love chickweed as a part of a, a topical, just because again, if we can stop you from itching it, that's going to make a big difference in getting the skin lesion to heal. And just out of curiosity, I realize that we're talking about pitorias uh, rosea, but for anyone else who's got maybe like eczema or an itchy psoriasis or something like yeah. that, would that also potentially be helpful to Absolutely. halt the itch? Yeah. And there's uh, several companies that we work with that uh, actually, you know, make creams. I said like that, that in fact, uh, we used to call it CCC cream. It was, you know, comfrey, chickweed and uh, uh, coneflower, which is actually echinacea. And so, you know, that combination, again, gets used a lot. So you'll see, you'll see the confident, you know, calendula, comfrey, chickweed, echinacea. You'll see some of these, these herbs getting mixed together. But uh, again, for where itch is the bigger problem, I would want to make sure that stellaria or chickweed was part of that formula. Oh, that's really cool. So basically, yeah. anybody that gets this, if they've got that pattern, I would assume it's best to go see a doctor, right? Just to make sure right. and rule out that it's not anything more serious. Absolutely. And then from there, it's just about taking care of the lesions, essentially, until they eventually resolve. Exactly. And again, I think this is about self-care. You know, it's getting better sleep. Make sure you're eating clean. Uh, again, with some of these nutrients I just discussed, you can do to help support your immune system. Mm -hmm. But again, even if you did absolutely nothing, it'll probably go away in a couple of months. But I do find when people do those things more proactively, you know, the lesions go away faster. Okay. It is a cosmetic issue more than anything else. Yeah. And one last question, as I was saying, like as far as stress reduction is concerned, because I do find that there is, whether the, the skin rash is caused stress or stress can I think it's a probably a vicious cycle it's a chicken right. and the egg problem do you find in your practice that there's any common recommendation that you give to your patients just about helping to manage stress that you find is helpful yeah. Well, you know, I think our, our mutual friend, Heidi Hanna, frames it that, you know, it's not about managing stress. It's about mastering stress. I like that concept much better because we all have stress. I mean, it's it's just if you live in the United States in 2019, it's it's a problem. <laughs> so I think, you know, it's the key to it, I think, is the consistency of whatever it is that you do that helps you master your stress. So I think what happens to a lot of people is that they just don't have a consistent routine where they're doing that kind of self-care. So for some people, it's their exercise regimen. Mm -hmm. For other people, it's doing art. For other people, it's, you know, whatever it is that you do that, you know, really allows your body to kind of downregulate, get off grid for a moment and just, you know, really take care of yourself. But people may do it very sporadically. I don't have enough time. You know, I've got too much to do at work. You know, whatever the excuse is that we don't do that. So the key is really the consistency of whatever it is that you do that, you know, you're doing on a regular basis that's helping you deal with that stress that, you know, is ongoing in your life. Absolutely. Well, I just want to thank you so much for not just sharing this, especially even though this, yes, is a relatively benign condition, it still could freak someone out. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's great to know that there are sometimes things that are self-limiting that can come on and they just need time to go away and we just need to really tune in, check in with ourselves, manage stress and support. Do, do a lot of self-care and support the body. Um, yeah, but absolutely. also, I want to remind everyone, too, if they haven't, to go back and check out your Lyme disease interview just simply because, like, apparently I am in Pennsylvania live in a hotbed <laughs> for Lyme disease. <laughs> you, you do. <laughs> and you did mention that, like, th this could also look like that potential, like a weird Lyme pattern. And so um, I think getting yourself acquainted with Lyme disease, no matter where you live, because it is such a huge problem, is important. Yeah. Your book is an excellent resource. The Lyme Solution, a five-part plan to fight the inflammatory autoimmune response and beat Lyme disease. We'll put the links to that in the show notes. And you also have, I know you have a Lyme quiz on your website, which is great to yeah. check out. Um, we'll put a link to that. And you've got the top 10 immune boosting recipes giveaway for everybody. Um, I just think that you're such a great wealth of knowledge and I really appreciate you coming back to share this with us. My pleasure. I'm so glad that we were able to have this conversation because like I said, if you develop this rash, you're probably gonna freak out. 
it's a pretty extensive rash and it looks pretty awful. And so it's nice to have this type of conversation to allow you to know when to freak out, when to talk to your doctor and when it might not be that big of a deal and something that could potentially resolve on its own. All of the resources that we have discussed in today's episode can be found in the show notes over at skinterrupt.com forward slash 126. You can also leave your questions and comments there so we can keep the conversation going. Don't forget, you've got to share this with people. There is an epidemic of Lyme disease in the United States, and this rash unfortunately confuses people into thinking that they may have Lyme. So this could be incredibly helpful for somebody that develops this rash and doesn't exactly know what to make of it. And before you head out for your day, remember to head on over to your podcast platform of choice, rate and review the show, and then hit the subscribe button. That way the next episode lands on your mobile device without you having to do a thing. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope that you are tending to your health in these very strange times. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.